Hello, and welcome to the Project Elected podcast. Project Elect is a nonpartisan nonprofit whose goal is pretty simple. We want to get more Latter-day Saint women involved in public service. On this podcast, we interview amazing Latter-day Saint women who are involved in public service. Hi, my name is Audrey Perry Martin. I'm the founder of Project Elect and the host of this podcast. I am excited today to talk to Rochelle Morris. Rochelle is running for Salt Lake County Council. I want to make sure I get that right because it's different than Salt Lake Council. And this is her first time running. So I'm excited to hear about her experience and what she's doing on the campaign trail. So Rochelle, tell us a little bit about yourself. What what made you decide to run? What's your background? How do you get to this place? Absolutely. Just like many women who I'm sure are tuning into this episode, I'm a descendant of Utah pioneers on both sides of my family. My parents met, married in Utah, moved to Houston for what they thought would be a few years and ended up raising seven children in Houston. So that's where I grew up. I'm the second of seven children, the oldest daughter in the family. So shout out to all the oldest daughters, oldest sisters in the family, because yes, you become the mini mom inside of large families as all of your siblings are growing up. Like many families and folks who I'm sure are listening to the podcast today, you're working really hard, putting a roof over your head, putting food on the table and trying to open doors of opportunities to your children to live the American dream. And that was the case with my parents. I'm privileged that I had both parents in my home. My dad was a food broker and would mow lawns on the weekends. And my mom taught piano before school, after school, the Suzuki music book. I heard it for decades. Right? <laughs> I actually did not learn how to play an instrument growing up because my brothers and I were always sent outside while my mom was teaching piano. And so we played all the sports known to man outside. But with that said, like money was a very limited resource in our home. And so my brothers and I, we were on the reduced lunch program when I was in elementary school. I think that it's totally fine that there are social safety net programs that the government and that nonprofits aid and assist in and that the LDS church aids and assist in when families need just a little bit of extra help to make ends meet. However, when my brothers and I, we spent one summer making PB&Js, cooking top ramen for ourselves and the whole shebang. I was going into the sixth grade and my mom was looking at us and it just been something that had been weighing on her of, am I allowing someone else outside of our home to be solving a problem that I think my children can solve for themselves at this point? And look, I have been talking with moms all over Salt Lake County while I've been campaigning. I know that there are lots of moms who are just like really trying hard to figure out how do I help my children grow up in a safe environment, but also have this mode of discovery and problem solving and self-sufficiency and self-determination that is what makes America so great, right? And this idea of progression and growth. So anyways... She yanked us off the reduced lunch program, family council style, sat us down, and she goes, we're done with the reduced lunch program. You can make a PB&J in the mornings, or you can figure out a way to make money to pay for lunch going forward, but we're not going to have the government do it for us anymore. And that honestly was what kicked off my journey as an entrepreneur, because it only took a couple months of me making PB&Js. For me to say, I miss the chicken nuggets, I miss the mashed potatoes, and I miss the chocolate milk. My dad came home from a trade show with tons of Wrigley's gum from the Wrigley's booth next door to him. And I was like, wait a second, there's no gum inside my school. Can I try to sell this gum? So I made $7.50 on my first day. I bought the ice cream, I bought the chocolate milk, I bought everything I wanted in the school cafeteria. And that kicked off my journey of making money for myself. By the time I was 18, I was financially independent. I got a full ride scholarship to BYU and became the first woman on my mom's side of the family to get a college degree. I majored in information systems and a little bank called Goldman Sachs recruited me out of school. And so I started my career in Salt Lake City worked for Goldman, lived in Sugar House for a couple of years, 
transferred to Dallas with Goldman, transferred to Houston with Goldman, got to work with some of the most prominent members of society in Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma and thinking through how do you optimize, maximize balance sheet and make money with the money that's there and understanding the capital markets and financial statements and sources of funding and how to make money with that money and cash flow and and all the things, right? I could nerd out for hours on on all of it. Anyways, JP Morgan, another little bank, recruited me to Salt Lake about six years ago to launch an office here. That's what got me to Salt Lake. With launching an office inside of Utah, I needed to just go all in on getting to know the community really well, investing my time, my talents, my skills, getting on nonprofit boards, getting involved. And I really experienced the beehive to be a little hokey, but Utah has something special between the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and the political sector. And two years ago, I launched a venture fund with my three partners We raise primarily from Utah-based entrepreneurs who want to invest in the new generation of entrepreneurs. And so here I am a couple years into that process as a venture capitalist, which I know sometimes is a four-letter word. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding of what venture capitalists do. The way that I like to think about it is we are giving really innovative entrepreneurs an opportunity to go from a small business to a big company by investing, you know, anywhere from 500,000 to millions of dollars into their company. And so going from being worth only like $10 million as a startup, they're hoping to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars someday. We join the roller coaster ride with them because it's it's high risk and I'm having a blast. But with that, I don't have to be in an office every single day from 8 to 7 like I was for many years of my career. And I have additional capacity to serve my community in another way. I got a phone call in the month of November from a LDS woman serving in office in the state of Utah. She goes, Rochelle, I really think you should run for office. I had been told that before a couple of times. And so I tried to just shrug her off and say, yeah, that's something that I've thought about. And maybe 10 years from now, that feels like maybe a good time for me to do it. And she goes, no. 10 years? Uh Uh-uh. No, I'm talking 10 weeks from now, we need you running for office. And she brought up a couple of races. And uh, one of those two races was the Salt Lake County Council. It's an at-large seat that represents the entire 1.2 million people of Salt Lake County. It's actually one and a half times the size of a congressional district when you think of number of constituents and voters. Jim Bradley has held the seat for 24 years. He's retiring. So this is one of the biggest open seat races in the state of Utah. And when you look at what the number one job of the Salt Lake County Council, it is to oversee and manage the purse strings of what is now a $1.9 billion annual budget. It's the second largest budget in the state of Utah. And given my background in managing money and being a fiduciary and a steward of money in the private sector, golly, to have the opportunity to step into this seat and represent just good, hardworking, everyday Utahns across the county who remind me so much of my parents, it would bring so much meaning to the career that I've had. I love that. And it's such a great background story. And it it makes sense why you're interested in the seat. But I do want to hear more about the Salt Lake County Council because usually it's county commissioners or supervisors in other states. What's the difference in Salt Lake between this county council and say the city council or what a county supervisor or commissioner would do? Great question. And it's a question that I usually get every single day on the campaign trail. Let's think about the levels of government who serve each one of us. We have our most local level of government is usually the city, a municipality, a township, right? Then the county, then the state, and then the federal, right? And so at your city level, you're electing usually a mayor and city council members, At a county level, depending on how the county is designed, you're either electing three commissioners or a mayor council form of government. 
Salt Lake County converted from a three commissioner system to mayor council form in the year 2000. So this is how we've been operating for 24 years. There are nine members of the council. Six of those members represent specific geographic districts of Salt Lake County. And so each of those districts comprise of about 200,000 people. The council members who serve in district seats, they serve four-year terms. The at-large seats represent the entire county, six-year terms. And one of the seats is up for re-election every two years. And I think it's really important for people to understand the framework because framework then creates behaviors inside of the framework, right? If you're thinking about it, it it impacts how humans behave in the jobs or roles that they sit in. So a district seat, they're representing their specific part of the county. They should be absolutely glued into what are the biggest issues, right? Now the at-large seats, we have the same constituents as the county mayor, who is the executive branch of Salt Lake County. So I view the at-large seat, and with a six-year term, I'm actually supposed to, I believe that the at-large seats are supposed to come in and understand what's going on in all of the districts around the county, but then go up to the 50,000-foot level and be a really strong, fierce advocate from the legislative side of the body of the council collaborating with the mayor's office, but also collaborating up to the state legislature and then also being connected to municipalities all across the county because I have the longest term. So I should be totally glued in and then also willing to lead out on some potential changes inside the county because I have the longest tail until I run for re-election again. Someone who's running, someone who's up for re-election two years from now it's really hard for them to do something that's risky in the public sector. With five years, we have time to implement a change. And if it's going well, then like keep implementing and overseeing and governing that. If it's not going well, I'm still in the seat two years from now. Do I lead out a pivot from that? It's structure just informs behavior. And I think it's really important for everyone tuning into this podcast to think about the seats that you're running for and what that actually means. Because I'll tell you what, running for office, campaigning, that takes up a lot of time and energy. You're running for a House seat in the state legislature or Congress every two years. You are running for re-election every two years. A state senator in the state of Utah, that's a four-year term, right? And a bigger geographic area that you cover. And obviously county council at large covering the entire county. It's an expensive race. It's a big race. I'm all over the place, but it's a six-year term. Yeah, you're right. It's important to understand the position you're running for because the position you're running for is one that somebody needs to be able to take a look at the whole county and to take a look at the long term and go from there. And maybe a house seat is different than that. And maybe every two years you're representing a smaller location different and city council different, obviously. And I think that's a good tip to look at the seat you're running for, how it's structured, how often you're going to have to run for re-election and where your skill sets best fit in. Absolutely. There's a joke in politics that there's people who just run just to run, right? They're candidates in search of an office. The only reason why I'm running this year is because I genuinely believe that I will add value to the council and that I will do a good job serving in this capacity. I'm not looking for the notoriety of being an elected official. Talking about notoriety, I always like to ask what kind of negative feedback you've gotten, because I feel like that's what holds a lot of women back from running. And I think in a particular letter, they say women, they don't want to deal with the internet trolls or the mean people or you know all the negativity that's in politics these days. Have you experienced that and how have you dealt with it if you have? Oh, I've experienced it since before I even launched my campaign in the month of December. Simon Sinek has a brilliant TED Talk and book, Start With Why. You have to know why you're running before you enter the race. And if you can understand your core why. And for me, I'm running for the people of Salt Lake County, not the politics of Twitter. 
understanding my why and my who of who my customer really is, is so critical. Let's talk about that Saturday in November. So I get a phone call from one LDS woman who serves in elected office, very senior lawmaker in the state of Utah. She's a very conservative Republican, and we've become good friends. She calls me. It's hard to say no to her. And actually, I got to start thinking about this. So then I called another LDS woman who's serving in elected office in the state of Utah. And I said, hey, this woman just said I should run for this office. And I was expecting this other woman to say, don't worry about it. Like, this is what happens before election years. People start making phone calls, start trying to find candidates for races. No. Instead, she goes, sounds like so-and-so just opened the door for you. I want you to leave it open for a week before closing it. Then I contact another LDS woman who has served in elected office in the state of Utah. And I would say that these three women swim in different lanes of the Republican Party. And I call this woman and I say, hey, I've been in touch with these two women and I don't know, what do you think? And she just so excited says, this is the best thing I've heard. You got to do this. I am 100% behind you. I think it's really important as candidates and especially women candidates, you've got to have some core people in your corner before you launch. And it's not like I'm talking to these women every day. They're all busy and everything. But I know if I need one of them, they're there for me. And there have been so many other LDS women who once I threw my hat in the ring and I started campaigning, they have just shown up for me. And other women, too, who are not LDS, religious and not religious, right? And so one of these women, she did say to me, she said, Rochelle, here's the weird thing with political campaigns that you just need to get ready for. There will be some people who you expect to be right there with you and they disappear from your life. And there will be other people you do not yet know who will surprise you because they will show up for you and they will lock arms with you. And that's just how campaigns work. So anyways, I have experienced that too. And I have experienced men in December calling me and saying, we really can't risk this election on a first time candidate. And I go, I see what you're saying. And I'm going to refute it because I just watched Representative Celeste Malloy as a first time candidate beat a whole bunch of more experienced candidates just last year. I actually think that voters in Utah are okay with my profile. And so just being comfortable with who you are. And once you decide like you're in, then you're in and you're in to win, right? And so I built out a team in December. I started going around and fundraising. We launched January 2nd. So I, I went around and, and started talking to individuals who are meaningful leaders in the community, tell them, hey, I'm 95% of the way there to throwing my hat in the ring. And a very kind-hearted man who can be a bit crusty, but is just such a sweetheart to me. He's an old retired venture capitalist. He goes, Rochelle, promise me you've got your inner circle in place because people will say the nastiest things about you and they will be mean and they will lie and they will not care that it's not true because they are just trying to win an election. And you need to have some heart to hearts with core inner circle people in your life where you say, I need to know that you are there for me, regardless of what is said about me over the next year. And he goes, obviously, I'm one of those people, but you need to have a circle of people around you. So then I called my older brother, who's a stake president in Southwest Missouri. And I go, Ryan, I need to know that you support me as my older brother. He goes, yeah, of course, Rochelle. And I go, no, I need to know that you are there for me as my big brother. And then it like sunk in. And he goes, oh, yeah, Rochelle, nothing that happens over the next year will impact me and my love for you. I've gone viral on Twitter already in this race. We had over a million Twitter impressions. I would call them the radical left wing of the Democrat Party came after me hard and just mischaracterized me and then just dragged my mom through the mud as well. We're leading into Mother's Day 
And my mom gets a Twitter account and all. And I'm like, no, mom, get off Twitter. And uh, you know what? Those three LDS women who I chatted with on that Saturday in November and have been obviously keeping in touch with them, they all showed up for me in that viral moment. And they all showed me like, Rochelle, we see you. We care about you, the woman. And we also care about you, the candidate. And we're going to help you get through this 48 hours of craziness. And we did. And here we are two weeks later. I'm totally fine. There's so much that you just said that I want to talk more about. But just the last thing that you said about the 48 hours getting through the period. I think that's one thing that I try to explain to people these days who haven't been in politics before. These things, they're blip and they come and they go high and it seems like it's the end of the world. And then everybody forgets about it 48 hours later. The cycle is so fast now. It might feel like your life is being ruined and everyone hates you, but it's over really soon. (laughs) Yes. And also you've got to be able to disassociate yourself and your campaign from whatever is happening in social media. And so that Thursday night when I was going viral, I deleted Twitter off of my phone. My team was manning the Twitter fort. And I continued on with my regularly scheduled campaign activity, which was knocking doors in Magna, Utah. And so as I'm going viral with like hundreds of thousands of Twitter impressions and all of the comments and the retweets and the quote tweets and all of the things. And it was really a proxy between the right and the left on a social policy thing. And I just happened to be the pretty blonde who could be leveraged as the chess piece behind something that was way bigger than who I am and my lived experience. But being in Magna that night, And talking with parents and grandparents on their front stoops, in their driveways, in their front yards, like it kept me grounded in the fact that like, you know what, most parents are working really hard. And most parents like they look at my mom deciding to take my brothers and me off of the reduced lunch program. And they say, yeah, that was a heroic decision that your mom made. And like, I felt that feeling before as a parent of, oh my gosh, like, how do I help my kid grow, but also nurture and love and protect? And those are the things that real parents are dealing with all the time. And so anyways, it it felt great to just stay in reality. You got to just stay in reality with your campaign. And I'm guessing none of those people whose doors you were knocking on had any idea what was going on in Twitter. I actually told them and told them the story. (laughs) And it's one mom, she goes, sounds like your mom is an awesome mom. And I go, she is. And so look, my family, the Morris family, we're nowhere near perfect. And as the oldest daughter with my mom, there were definitely times we knocked heads a lot, as any oldest sister in a family knows. But the campaign has really been a unifying force inside of our family and something to rally around, which has been just really energizing on a human level. So I took my nieces to go to KSL Radio Studios yesterday. They're six and eight years old. I got interviewed and I wanted to show them like KSL Studios, right? Downtown and office. And my friend, Melanie Jones, she's the editor of Utah Business Magazine. And I used to be on her editorial advisory board. So we went up to her office real fast. She introduced them to the magazine. They both got their own copy of a magazine, right? And I got to tell them, yeah, Melanie's the boss of this whole magazine. And they're like, what? And so the campaign just provides opportunities like that inside my family that win, lose, or whatever happens along the way, it makes it totally worth it. Yeah. And that that's so great to be able to take those little girls and show them those things. I think it's fantastic when we can bring our younger generation in and show them you can do this too. I have three daughters and they think they can do anything. That's great experiences for your nieces, for sure. One thing I wanted to talk about that you said, you were talking about how these three Latter-day Saint women just were your support group and recruited you to run. And I just love that, obviously, (laughs) from the Project Elect perspective. That's what we're asking people to do all the time is look at who you know. If you're not going to run, or maybe you have already run, look at who you know and say, that woman would make an amazing elected official and tell her that and encourage her to run and encourage her to jump in and maybe not in 10 years, but right now. And 
give them that support and then offer the support after that. Don't just disappear after you tell them to run. Yes. And that's the thing is there's another Latter-day Saint woman who she's run for office in another state. So not in the state of Utah, but she's currently serving in Governor Cox's cabinet. And it was over a year ago, actually at my birthday party, there were, I don't know, 70 women at this birthday party. It was awesome. And I gave just like a a little, not speech, toast. I don't know. I got toasted. And so I stood up and just said, if I had told 18-year-old Rochelle what 38-year-old Rochelle would look like, I wouldn't be able to comprehend it. And yet today... I feel like the luckiest woman and just spoke to some of the power of the women in the room. And anyway, so this, this other Latter-day Saint woman, she pulled me aside and she goes, Rochelle, I think you should run for office. And I'm like, oh, and she's not, I think you got it. I think you got it. To your point, her planting that seed over a year ago and someone who I really respect and admire her character and her intellect and the fact that she's run for office before. And she always talks about, hey, for candidates, you've got to be willing to do the job, right? But it's also got to be the right wave. So if you think of the beach and waves coming in, you don't want to be crashing into the wave. You want to be riding a wave and getting that momentum into winning an election. I am hoping I have caught the right wave with this campaign yeah. for who I am, my profile, my skill set, and what Salt Lake County voters are looking for in a county council member. And I think that's an important thing to remember, right? Like you can run for office and be a fantastic candidate and still lose because of things completely out of your control, things on the national level, the global level, or the state level that have nothing to do with you. That's where the wave is right now. And for example, I live in Salt Lake City. I live in a very blue house district in a very blue Senate district at the Utah state legislative level. It would not make sense for me to run for either of those seats as a Republican. I think people get really sick of politicians who try and make themselves fit the candidacy or the district as opposed to being themselves and standing for what they really believe and issues they really care about and peddling their actual skills instead of trying to make something up. And I think it's so much easier to run for office if you're being authentic and you believe that you are a great person to serve in this office and that your skill set and your abilities really align with what you're running for and how you can help. I think voters can pick up on, we'll just say politely, the BS from candidates, things that just don't quite seem authentic or we call it grifting, right? Like voters are pretty, voters are smart, not pretty smart. Voters are very smart. And I've been surprised. I I had maybe said one or two things that just didn't quite feel authentically me. And I got called out for it Yeah, in this campaign cycle. But one thing that my team and I did in the month of December. It was the week before Thanksgiving that I got the phone call. And then we had about six weeks for me to make up my mind, recruit a team, start fundraising, get the website, get the logo, get all of it wrapped up, ready to go and launch by January 2nd. My Christmas holidays were definitely an interesting set of holidays (laughs) this past year. But one thing that we did in December, my team and me, is they had me just do a Google Doc And just stream of consciousness, just start writing out personal stories, why I'm running, things I care about, things I care about that the county oversees, things that I care about that are happening in Salt Lake County. Just anytime I had some thoughts, just jot them down and just stream of consciousness. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about just get it out on paper. And so then my team and I could take all of that and their experienced strategists uh, and say, okay, Rochelle cares about work. Rochelle loves work. Rochelle works hard. (laughs) All right, here's our campaign slogan. Let's make Salt Lake County work better for you. Let's make Salt Lake County work, work better for all of us. That is something I work hard. I want the county to work better and I want us to value work. That's just so authentically me that I don't have to think about like, what's my talking point here? No, I'm going to yeah. work hard to get the county to work better so that all of y'all can work and enjoy the 
process of work in society. Yeah. It's an authentic, it's who you are. And so it's so much more natural to talk about it instead of trying to remember, okay, what did the polls say I should say about this? I feel like politicians do all the time yes. and it drives me crazy. And issues do come up, right? Mm -hmm. Like a national issue like the border. Yeah. Okay. How does the border impact my specific race? Yeah. And what is my view on the issue of how it actually impacts Salt Lake County? Okay, that's my talking point. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not just going to hurl some bombs about the border one way or the other that don't bring it back down to what does this mean for Salt Lake County and Salt Lake County residents and Salt Lake County, the government. And quite frankly, fentanyl is coming through the border and there's a whole lot more fentanyl in Salt Lake County today than there was five years ago. And that is a negative drain on society. And it impacts our homelessness, our issues around public safety and homelessness. It impacts mental health. It impacts our county jail. So getting it down to, I can talk about fentanyl on the campaign trail, because that is actually a county issue. Like you said, voters are smart. They know when the local, somebody who's running for a local or county office is talking about a national issue that they can't do anything about. That has nothing to do with the county, right? And I don't, voters don't like that. They want to know what you're going to do in the office you're running for. And you can give a fiery speech and say all the national talking points you want, but voters are smarter than that and they see through it. Voters also look for very quick signals of who you are politically and ideologically, right? So the specific words you use, the specific terms you use, they do signal the type of political ideology you fall into. And then, but I won convention this year, Republican GOP convention with 58% of the vote. And it's because I did 32 events with delegates between caucus and convention. I worked so hard and I had lots of conversations, right? So that if there was a Republican delegate who wanted me to say, the border is a disaster. And I didn't say that, but I said, this is how what's happening at the border is impacting our county and having those conversations. Then I won over those delegates because they're like, you know what? She didn't give us the first loud statement that we wanted on it, but she gave us a very structured thought and a solutions based a statement. And so anyways, there you go. That's great. That's great. And I think that's good advice for people who are running for office. You don't have to say the controversial big things. You just need to talk about how it affects the people who you're supposed to represent and, and be genuine yeah. about it. We are running out of time. I would love it if you had like an invitation for our listeners of something that they could do in the next little while to get more politically involved and hopefully run for office one day. Volunteering for another Republican woman's, anyone, but volunteering for another Republican woman's campaigns over the last couple of years, it helped me understand the nuts and bolts of what goes into a campaign. And so I am not surprised by the amount of work, the type of work, what needs to get done. And so come on, I've got plenty of opportunities for you to get involved. And I'm telling you, we're going to have a lot of fun. Vote RochelleMorris.com is my website. I have an Instagram account, Rochelle Morris UT. And also my Twitter account is at Rochelle underscore Morris. Those are the easiest ways to find me. If you're a LinkedIn person, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Thank you so much. And I think that is great advice, especially if you're in Utah right now. Find someone to go volunteer for, right? The, the primary is coming up. It, the primary in Utah generally is who wins in a lot of the state. And so go and help somebody on a campaign. Get a feel for what campaigns are like. Get a feel for what it is like working with the candidate. And it also helps you get to know the candidates better and solidify who you're voting for. It's been so fantastic talking to you. Getting to know you a little bit, Rochelle. I love your story. I love all of the great advice you had to offer us. So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Well, Audrey, thank you so much for having me. It means a lot. And let's go make Salt Lake County work better for all of us. Thank you all for listening to the Project Elected podcast. For free resources and materials, head over to projectelectwomen.org. We're also on Instagram and Facebook as Project Elect Women. We'd love for you to subscribe, rate us, or give us a review on iTunes. So until next time, thank you.